You're watching The 7 from WATE 6 on your side. Good evening, I'm Bo Williams, and welcome to The 7. Let's get a look at the Big 7 stories right now. And topping the list for us, a story that's been around for generations is now gone after an enormous fire. Firefighters in Townsend heard the alarm right around 1045 and rushed out. When they got to the store, flames were already showing through two windows. Due to the store's layout and metal roof, the fight not easy. And the building itself is now in ashes. Owner Jerry Sullivan grew up in the store. The shopping center had been there since at least the late 1940s. Sullivan took over from his father and grandfather. It became known for his collection of case knives, some of them rare and fetching high prices. Stuff people would pay a lot of money for. But I wouldn't sell them. One of the worst things, so there's a set of knives that was in there that uh, I was offered $8,000 for last week. And now it's burnt up. Sullivan says he might buy or build another small store and only sell knives. Around 1,000 were saved from the fire, but at 75 years of age, retirement is another possibility. The cause of the fire is still under investigation tonight. Our next Big 7 and 7 story in East Tennessee School Board under scrutiny for taking action against a Pulitzer Prize winning book. The McMinn County School Board voted to pull the graphic novel Mouse out of its schools. Now that's strong criticism from all across the country. Mouse by Arthur Art Spiegelman uses cats and mice in stark black and white drawings to detail the horrors of Auschwitz and the Holocaust under the Nazi regime. McMinn County Board of Education said it does not diminish the value of Mouse as a meaningful piece of literature or the importance of teaching the lessons and reality of the Holocaust. It is some language and imagery which drew concerns from the board, voting earlier in the month to ban Mouse from eighth grade English classes. Now, the board put out a statement today saying the vote was because of the book's, quote, unnecessary use of profanity and nudity and its depiction of violence and suicide. The statement goes on to say, taken as a whole, the board felt this work was simply too adult-oriented for use in our schools. The controversy turned up in lots of places today, including Tennessee's General Assembly. Books are being stripped out of public libraries that give detailed personal accounts from survivors and about victims of the Holocaust. There's a lot of talk about that. Uh, there are a lot of books that um, are in our library system in the schools, even in elementary schools, and no one seems to know how they got there. The band got national news coverage and reaction against the move, notably from the U.S. Holocaust Museum, tweeting that Mouse, quote, has played a vital role in educating about the Holocaust through sharing detailed and personal experiences of victims and survivors. Well, our next big story, What's going to happen tomorrow? For one thing, we know some kids aren't going to school and others are going to go home early. Claiborne County Schools are closed. Granger County Schools will be closing at noon and Hancock County Schools closing at 1130, all because of the weather. We should note Greenville City Schools are closed, but due to illness. Well, I am over here in the Storm Center now with meteorologist Ken Weathers to kind of walk us through now what you can expect. I know we've been talking about the, the wintry weather, mm -hmm. but we're also talking just some bitterly cold temperatures. Everybody's going to get on the cold. Not yeah. everybody sees snow. Everybody gets cold. And it's yeah. bitterly cold, though. We talk about this maybe 40-plus hours of below freezing temperatures from about Friday afternoon to Sunday afternoon. Quiet right now. This is the 275 flyover there at I-40 here, coming eastbound into town in downtown Knoxville, where we're 46 degrees. 42 in Crossville, 42 in Wartburg, a chilly 37 in Middlesbrough. Clouds have rolled into the area, but we're dry tonight. No snow tonight. We're in the mid to upper 20s on the plateau and low 30s in the valley. So through the day tomorrow, slim chance of snow in the morning. I think it will ramp up a little bit in the afternoon because initially the atmosphere is so dry. It's going to be evaporating before it reaches the ground. You know, you look to the horizon and the clouds look very dark and it looks like stuff's falling from them. I think that's kind of what we'll see. And then eventually, as the atmosphere gets a little more moist, we will see the opportunities for some light snow. But again, temperatures will drop through the afternoon as well. So a light mix could be a raindrop or two mixed in eventually or uh, early on. I think it's mainly just light snow. And this is that fluffy kind of snow, not the heavy wet snow like we normally see, which is again why we think there'll be limited travel concerns across the area. Probably not the case though for the foothills 
and Smokies. I'll talk more about that coming up in a minute, though. All right, Ken, we'll check back with you. Well, talk of snow brings us to the next big story, the roads. TDOT spokesperson Mark Nagy tweeted out this picture, one of the department's trucks uh, putting some brine on the roads and really asking drivers to give them extra room to do their job safely. Meanwhile, Knox County's public works supervisor tells us his workers use today's nice weather to gear up their plow trucks and put on the salt spreaders, but the county and the state are taking different approaches to the pre-treating decision. But with the rain and the way the forecast and temperatures look, uh, we, we chose not to do a brine application beforehand. Doesn't look like we're supposed to get much rain before the snow would arrive. Uh, so that will hopefully, as the temperatures drop, uh, set up a layer so we don't have too much ice. Blount County, meanwhile, is putting out a mix of mostly calcium and a little salt to prepare their roadways. Whatever the choice, we heard a caution today that salt and chemicals can only go so far when temperatures drop down into the 20s and below. So they need help from all of you. Stay off the roads if you can. If you have to drive, slow down, go easy on the brakes. Also, make sure your car is in good shape and stocked up with warm clothes, food, water, and a first aid kit. KUB officials are giving advice on how you can conserve heat in your home during these cold days ahead. The first tip, keep the heat inside your home. Make sure all doors that lead outside are closed as much as possible. You can also make sure those weather strips are in good shape. And keep your home as cold as you comfortably can. Officials say the ideal setting is 68 degrees, but anything below that will save you money on your bill. Now, there are also programs for those struggling to pay their bills. If you do find yourself in a need, um, there are programs out there, you know, this is the time of year we, we do have folks uh, donate to Project Help, um, but that Project Help will also, is, is exactly what it is, it's for people that need assistance um, because of heating or, or other, other needs this time of year with their utility bills, um, so there is uh, programs out there to help folks make sure their lights stay on and their heat stays on as well. Bryant adds, you can always download the KUB app on your phone to track how much energy your house is using. Well, from weather to coronavirus as we move through the big seven stories for you. And we're going to start now with numbers from two local hospital groups. First in line, Covenant Health. Uh, COVID patients in the ICU there down slightly today. But the big take note of this is the other part of the bar graph as you look behind me. A, a noticeable decrease in the overall COVID hospitalizations. As you can see, the drop off there at the very right hand of the screen. This is from the hospitals from yesterday to today there with Covenant. But over at UT Medical Center, the hospitalization numbers went in the opposite direction. Now at 170 today, and while there's a decrease in the ICU number shown in this orange line here along the graph, well, that's compared to earlier in the month, that figure has grown. Also, take note that the vast majority of COVID patients shown here in red, you can see it right here, currently right now about 77% were not fully vaccinated. Also from UT Medical Center today, we heard another word of caution about not taking Omicron lightly. Despite COVID deaths and ICU cases not keeping up with the massive overall spike and the number of people getting sick. Today, we reminded, uh, or actually the doctor reminded us that the public about the letter sent from local hospitals yesterday urging people not to come to the emergency room unless it is absolutely necessary since facilities right now are so stretched thin. It seems that early on, the Omicron variant got this reputation of just not being that severe. But when you add the number of patients we've had in the hospital, combine that with the number of staff we've had out sick due to COVID-19, and then just factor in the cumulative fatigue in the healthcare workforce, we feel that this has been the most challenging wave of the entire pandemic. Yeah, Dr. Samia believes COVID-19 cases will peak in the next week or so in our area. Then the situation will start to improve. And wrapping up our big seven stories for you right now, we're hearing from Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer about his plans now to retire from the high court. Today, President Joe Biden wanted to honor Justice Breyer and reemphasize his commitment to make history with the nominee to follow in his footsteps. The two made Breyer's retirement announcement official today, speaking to the nation from the Oval Office, formally announcing that the move will happen at the end of the court's term in June. Breyer said the great American experiment is not over and calling on the next generation to uphold the Constitution. They'll determine whether the experiment still works. And of course, I am an optimist, and I'm pretty sure it will. The person I will nominate will be someone with extraordinary qualifications, and that person will be the first black woman ever nominated to the United States Supreme Court. President Biden says he will announce his nominee to replace Breyer by the end of February.